1992, I started working within the Swedish military and intelligence service. Um, the qualifications I had were mainly that I spoke Russian because I had studied it at the University of Stockholm. I was 21 back then. I mean, yeah, you can do the math. It's uh, more than 30 years ago, and I was so incredibly young compared to now. And I realized that 1992, there are people in here that were not even born. <laughs> um, so I worked there for almost two decades before leaving. And after that, I've been working in the defense industry in Sweden at Saab. I've been running my own company within information security. And today I'm part of TrueSec, which is a cybersecurity company. But my focus when it comes to cybersecurity isn't the technical threats or the technical security solutions, but the human factor. I'm also an author with three published spy novels, surprise, spy novels. And the first one is partly taking place in Helsinki, where the main character meets with her Russian source. That book is in Swedish. But the second one, uh, The Domino Effect, uh, I will try, Domino Effecti. Okay, thank you. Uh, it will be published in Finnish in uh, uh, November 1st. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the third one was uh, just published a few weeks ago. Uh, the focus in all three books are on Russian intelligence operations targeting Europe. Speaking of which, last month on September 19th, the International Criminal Court, ICC, in The Hague announced that they had been targeted in a cyber attack. Hopefully, the ongoing investigation will give us some answers on, for example, what the purpose of the attack was, meaning what kind of information were they after? How well did they succeed? Because if the attacker didn't get what they were after, they will try other ways to access it, and not necessarily with a cyber attack. And last but not least, who was the attacker? The interest for the ICC is not new. Last year, the man in this picture applied for an internship there. In his application, he claimed to be a Brazilian citizen named Victor Muller Ferreira, uh, but his real name was Sergei Vladimirovich Cherkasov, and he is a so-called illegal, working for the GRU, the Russian Military Intelligence Service. Illegals are the most difficult category of Russian um, intelligence officers to expose since they invest years in building their legend, their cover story, with false identities, false documents, and education abroad to create the necessary credibility. Cherkasov failed, but if he had succeeded, it would have given the GRU access from the inside of that building. So why would Russia take interest in what happens there? Well, the ICC investigates war crimes, including these committed by Russians in Ukraine. And they have issued an arrest warrant for the Russian President Vladimir Putin. So probably two good reasons for them to know what's happening in there. We still don't know who was behind the cyber attack in September. Maybe it was Russia, maybe it was someone else. But what we do know is that the GRU are very active and aggressive in their intelligence collection, that they already before had shown interest in the ICC via Mr. Cherkasov here, that they have done other intelligence operations against other international organizations in the Netherlands, so obviously they know the way there. <laughs> and we also know that when one method isn't working, they will try another one. And since Cherkasov's plan to infiltrate the ICC didn't succeed, they might have tried other methods, for example, a cyber attack. 
most companies and organizations today understand that they one day might suffer from a cyber attack, a cyber breach, and therefore take different precautions to protect themselves and the data. But a consequence of us creating more secure technical environment is that the attacker will use other methods. I will, will give you one example. In 2010, an American company which develops and produces wind turbine technology was targeted by a Chinese company, or rather the Chinese intelligence service. But let's start from the beginning. A few years earlier, China passed a clean energy law calling for several wind farms throughout the whole country. And this law made China the hottest wind market in the world. And in 2009, a new turbine was going up in China every hour. The American company was expanding, as I said, in China. And one of the largest uh, clients was a Chinese company that would produce the hardware in factories in China. Uh, but the Americans would keep control of the software. They realized that that was important. So they kept the source code out of China in a research facility in Austria, where only a small group of people had access to it, on a network isolated from the internet. And the code itself was encrypted. Quite good countermeasures, right? At least for me. I'm a non-techie. But however, in 2010, the Chinese managed to recruit a man called Dejan Karabasovic, who worked in this research facility in Austria. And he was one of their most valuable software engineers. Karabasovic leaked the source code and even traveled to China on his vacation to help them install it. And five months later, and five months is nothing, the stolen code was in more than a thousand Chinese turbines, and they no longer uh, needed the American company, who lost its largest client. This led to an 84% drop in the stock value and the layoff of 600 people. That was about two-thirds of the task force, uh, workforce. And although they had taken precautions to protect the source code, it just wasn't enough. One malicious insider almost took down the whole company. Love this picture. When it comes to espionage, especially human intelligence, I would say that we are rather naive. And there are some preconceptions that seem to be global. The most common is probably that recruiting spies, that was something that they did during the Cold War before internet and cyber attacks. And with those who do understand that human is still a method in use, most people seem to have difficulties understanding that someone in their own organization could be targeted, and even less that they themselves could be targeted. Another preconception is that if they were approached by an intelligence officer, they would instantly discover what was going on. I mean, everyone knows what they look like. Right. So even if we don't actually believe that intelligence officers wear trench coat and a slouch hat today, it's still a problem that we don't really know what it looks like, how it works, or even worse, we don't even believe that it exists, but it does. Can you hear me okay? Good. A report published last year by the Swedish Defense Research Institute shows that there were 62 individuals suspected of espionage in Europe between 2010 and 2021. 62. At the end of this time frame, 42 of them were convicted and another 13 were awaiting trial. 37 out of these 42 were spying for one of the Russian services, which is GRU, FSB, or the SVR, 42, uh, 37 of the 42. And the remaining five were China, Iran, or Belarus. So I will walk you through one of the cases quickly. At 7.06, February 26, in 2019, 
at a restaurant in Stockholm, not far away from the Trusek office, actually. A 45-year-old man was arrested by the Swedish security service on suspicion of espionage. In his pocket, an envelope containing 27,800 Swedish crowns was, were found, and this is like 2,500 euro. He was an IT consultant running his own business, and at the time he was working for Scania, one of the leading providers of transport solutions in Sweden. And before that, he had an assignment at Volvo Cars, which is another one. He was not alone at this restaurant. At the same table sat Yevgeny Umerenka, who is a Russian intelligence officer, although his business card said that he was a diplomat. And since he had diplomatic immunity, he was free to leave. Uh, but the IT consultant, he did not have any such guarantees. And in 2021, he was sentenced to three years in prison for spying for Russia for approximately two years, three years, talking about the American uh, sentences we before here. Um, sorry. Since this report was completed, at least two more have been convicted, also in Sweden. And I'm talking about two brothers who you might have heard about, or not, yeah. um, that earlier this year was, were found guilty of spying also for Russia. And this has been called the worst spy scandal ever in Sweden, since uh, one of the brothers, the older one, used to work within both the Swedish security service uh, SAPO, and the Military Intelligence and Security Service, where I used to work. He was sentenced to life in prison, uh, Swedish life in prison, um, and his brother, <laughs> his brother, uh, his younger brother was acting as a courier, and he was the one that had handed over the information to the Russian intelligence officer and got the money. He got almost 10 years in prison. So, um, What's important to understand is that the cases included in this uh, Swedish study uh, of European cases is like the tip of the iceberg. Because under the water uh, is all the, uh, the cases that haven't uh, yet been disclosed and cases that for different reasons won't be official. Because sometimes countries doesn't want to um, have this um, conversation with uh, a bigger uh, Eastern neighbor, for example. So there are different categories of Russian intelligence officers um, that, amongst other clandestine work, recruit spies in our countries. And the first category are intelligence officers working on an embassy, a trade representation, or a consulate, posing as, for example, a cultural attaché or a trade council. They have diplomatic immunity, as I mentioned, and they cannot be arrested. Um, the worst that can happen to them is that they are expelled. On the negative side, from their perspective, is that they are, for obvious reasons, on the radar already of the hosting country's counterintelligence. So that's their backside of it. And the second category is called NOC, non-official cover. And they are intelligence officers that might not deny or hide that they are from Russia, but um, uh, there are no evident connection to their intelligence services or to the government. Instead, they claim to be programmers or businessmen to represent a startup, to be a journalist, or represent a think tank. And they are often employed or connected to real companies or organizations to create a more solid cover. And the risk that they take is that if they are exposed, they might be prosecuted and spend some time in jail. The third category are illegals, as Cherkasov, as I mentioned before. Have you seen The Americans on Netflix? Netflix, anyone? few of you have. You know what illegals are then. 
This TV series is based on a real case. Uh, a Russian spy ring that was exposed in the United States in 2010, and 10 people were arrested. There were four married couples, and two of the couples also had children, who probably had no idea that their parents were Russian intelligence officers. Surprise! <laughs> um, so, the illegals in this spy ring, they had been living ordinary American lives for decades, some of them. And in November last year, the Norwegian Security Service arrested a 37-year-old Brazilian academic named Jose Assis Jamara. Uh, he came to Norwegian University in Tromsø in December 2021 as a guest researcher to study hybrid warfare. And he also showed a uh, great interest in the Arctic security solution, uh, situation. The Norwegian Security Service, however, claims that he's not from Brazil, and nor is he 37 years old, but instead he is a 44-year-old Russian illegal whose real name is Mikhail Valerievich uh, Mikushin. And there are more examples of exposed Russian illegals in Europe during the latest uh, three years, I would say. If you want to switch job, most of the time, unit operations are very long-term. It might take months or even years from the approach and until a person is fully recruited and delivers truly good information. The process when recruiting an agent, or we can call it an insider, consists of, of several steps. The purpose of the first step is to understand where to find the information they need, for example, at a certain company. And the second step is to understand who has access to this information. It's probably more than one. And this is, uh, work is something that you could do via, for example, LinkedIn today. We've already talked about LinkedIn and how that works when uh, you want to find information about people. Um, you could also find it uh, interesting, uh, interesting information from, um, uh, for example, conference lists where you sign up and you sign which company it is and so on. And the third step is where they map the person or persons that are believed to have access. And since personal knowledge makes it more likely that they will succeed in their approach. They want to know as much as possible. Financial situation, personality, family situation, interests, and possible vulnerabilities. And most important, are they believed to be recruitable? That's what you want to know. And this information could be found via, for example, social media. And the approach is, of course, when contact is made, and it will most likely feel random. You are seated next to each other at the flight, start chatting in the hotel bar, or attend the same conference. Sorry, don't be paranoid here. <laughs> oh, uh, a bit. Um, and the person approaching you will not say, hey, I'm working for this uh, country's intelligence service. They will, of course, have some sort of cover that works for the situation. And then they will try to develop some sort of relationship as friends, business partners, or even lovers. They will try to get to know you better. How are things at work? How are your finances? And where are your loyalties? They will also want you to get used to accepting gifts or small amounts of money for smaller assignments, innocent assignments. And this is to break down your vigilance and judgment, and this step is called cultivation. And in the last phase, they will ask you to hand out really sensitive or secret information. And if you do that, you are fully recruited. So sharing is not always caring. <laughs> but I totally agree on you, with you on the other situation. On this topic, espionage, uh, what I find is uh, most interesting is who becomes a spy and why. 
what makes people betray their employer and even their country. An exposed spy will almost certainly lose his job, his reputations, possibly his family and friends, not to mention the risk of imprisonment, and in some countries, even worse than that. And I say his on purpose, since international research shows that most people that have been recruited are well-educated, middle-aged men. Research, not me. <laughs> and the Swedish report that I mentioned earlier, um, they, that points in the same direction. 95% uh, of those who were convicted for espionage in Europe between 2010 and 2021, 95% were men. And the two women that were convicted had spied together with their husbands, who were the persons with the actual access. When someone gets entangled in espionage, it's often triggered by a personal problem or a crisis. It could be a divorce, death of a loved one, or redeployment meaning it might be connected to a work situation, but it doesn't have to. It could be something private. This personal problem or crisis is likely to be combined with a lack of inner control and some sort of motive, a vulnerability, that is identified and exploited by a threat actor. Money is a classic motive, but it's often combined with other vulnerabilities such as ego, ideology, or disgruntledness. Almost all ca uh, cases that I have studied, spy cases, both modern and historical, have involved money, almost all. But most of the time, money is usually not the solitary reason. Instead, it's a combination of different drivers that also might vary over time. It can start with disgruntledness, but that it's the money, or the opposite. Besides, certain personalities have been identified as common with the persons that have been recruited. For instance, grandiose, narcissistic, manipulative, impulsive, thrill-seeking, easily led, extreme but misdirected loyalty, and a strong need to feel valuable. I spoke to the um, finance sector recently, and they said, well, that's all the middle management. <laughs> um, so if we take a look at um, a couple of the cases we've talked about today, Karabasevic, the software engineer working at the American wind uh, turbine company, he was offered $1.7 million from the Chinese. So one could assume that's why he did it, $1.7 million. It's a bit more than the 2,500 euros uh, without a consultant working for uh, Scania and Volvo. Uh, but the FBI agent who was investigating this Karabasevich and the wind turbine uh, company, he also described this young man as a person with a big ego and a growing hatred and resentment towards his American employer. So probably it was a combination. And the IT consultant arrested in Stockholm, he had... <sighs> okay. He had a, a terrible situa financial situation. Business wasn't going well, and he had listed things that potentially would get him back on track, and it included plans such as reduce private loans because they are expensive. If he knows how, please let me know. Uh, pay less in taxes each month. Make Android apps or excellent software to sell and get rich from that. Or, this was funny, write a book. <laughs> Bad idea because it won't make you rich, at least not me. Uh, but besides from his financial struggles, he was also convinced that he was overqualified for the assignments he had as an IT consultant at Scania and Volvo. He was overqualified. And uh, Peyman Kia, who was the guy working in the Swedish uh, security service and the military and intelligence service um, while spying for Russia, he claims that he did it for money. 
which pos uh, probably is true as well. But at the same time, he stated the following in an interview recently. Without doubt, I was the one in Sweden that knew the most about everything. Should we go back to the personalities? Of um, yeah, so um, he has been described as, as uh, pretty grandiose. Um, so in 1964, <laughs> that's why that guy is there, uh, Stig Wennerström, a Swedish Air Force officer, he was convicted for treason for espionage activities on behalf of the Soviet Union. Uh, he spied for them for 15 years. And he had uh, handed over everything uh, he knew about uh, the Swedish defense. Uh, and 15 years is a long time. He was also paid by the Soviets, but at the same time, recorded interviews with him from this time shows a grandiose or even narcissistic personality. He was truly convinced that it was thanks to him that there was this balance between East and West during the, the Cold War. It was thanks to him. What he really was doing was betraying his own country. And one person, the young man down there, maybe you recognize him, um, he didn't do it for money. That's Jack Teheira. Do you remember this case from earlier this year? He was responsible for the Pentagon leak, leakage, leak, onion, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> um, it's water, I promise. <laughs> what he did, he was arrested after publishing hundreds of secret and even top secret documents in a chat forum online. And the reason he did this was to impress the rest of the group. That's why he did it. No one asked him. He wasn't recruited by a foreign power. He just wanted to impress the rest of the group. Uh, so nevertheless, the damage was quite big. I'll check the time before maybe we'll skip this one. You think? but you don't know how much more I'm going to talk about. Yeah, 10 o'clock. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll, I'll, sorry? Yeah, the benefit, <laughs> but you will soon sneak away and grab a beer and get out of here. Okay, so besides offering a person money or boosting their ego or using uh, disgruntledness, threat actors also compromise people and use extortion or blackmail people into cooperation if that helps them to achieve their goals. This is still happening. But this hotel room is from uh, Moscow back in 1971. Um, one of hundreds or maybe thousands of rooms where KGB had installed hidden cameras and eavesdropping equipment. And foreign visitors of interest were placed in these rooms and everything said and done there was documented. And if it was useful, they would use it. Putin actually played a part in one of these operations as late as 1997. Not that long ago, not to me at least. Uh, back then, he was head of FSB, the Russian Security Service, and he helped President Yeltsin to compromise Russian chief prosecutor, Yuri Skuratov. Skuratov had started an investigation on corruption in the Kremlin. He knows what happens then. Uh, and this was something that was not appreciated by the leaders of the country since many of them was involved in this uh, corruption. So Putin made sure that the prosecutor was filmed in bed with two young women, very young women, and then published this film in national media. Skuratov was uh, humiliated in public, and he had to uh, leave his position, and the case against the Kremlin was shut down. And the grateful Yeltsin appointed Putin as prime minister, and a couple of years later, well, now he's the president of Russia. Uh, this was more than 25 years ago, and the purpose was to stop an unwanted investigation, but creating situations that look bad for example, by using honey traps and then take advantage of that is a method that is still being used. And the purpose could be to make 
an employee um, hand out secret information or to bring a memory stick inside of the company and put it in a computer. So this still works. When talking about insiders, there are some warning signs to be aware of that could uh, indicate that something is wrong. For example, disgruntled employee behavior, uh, such as displays of anger, negative attitude, or talking about leaving the company. Accessing or downloading a large, uh, large amounts of data, or frequently working late, or being in the office during off hours when there's not so much people there to see what you're doing. Of course, there might be, I want to say that, good reasons for a person uh, working very early and very late. So don't jump into conclusions. But the problem is rather the opposite that we don't want to talk about. We don't want to see this. These are warning signs that most of the time when there is an, uh, an incident, people say, yeah, but we saw that. We saw this and that and that. But no one sat down with the individual and talked with him or her about it. Like, are you a spy or are you thinking of becoming a spy? If you're not, we, maybe we can <laughs> arrange something. Um, I think that if you have a, an employee who's not happy at work, um, it might not be connected to work. It can be something that happens in their private lives, a difficult divorce or something else. A gambling problem that makes them spend more money than they have. Uh, if you have a conversation with this person in time, there might be things to do to help this person. So I don't see it as we should suspect our colleagues and, and check everything, but it, can we help a person, can we talk to them before a threat actor approaches them and it's too late. So there are things we can do uh, to prevent to mitigate the risk, and it starts with understanding that who we hire matters. When we hire people, both employees and consultants, we tend to only focus on competence and sometimes personality, if this guy will be a good part of the team. Um, but by adding security vetting to the process, we have the possibility to make sure that the people that we let on the inside are loyal and trustworthy. As, as um, I mean, it's not 100%, but it's at least trying to do that. Uh, and that there are no vulnerabilities that could be used if exposed by a threat actor. But vetting, security vetting needs to be followed up, I don't know, every year, every second year, every third year, because people's life changes and uh, it's not that often that people start working with a company uh, with the intent to be disloyal. This is something that happens later on, as mentioned, because of stress-related things in life, because of life. And uh, I also want to stress the importance of awareness. If we know who the threat actors are, like we talk about here today, and the different methods they use, we become less of a... a a sitting duck since it is much more difficult for a threat actor to to approach someone and try to recruit someone who knows how this works and uh, training doesn't have to be more complicated than what we're doing here tonight so if you want to talk more about spies and how we uh, help clients with insider prevention so please come talk to me uh, and uh, or Contact me via LinkedIn or talk to my colleague Matti. Talk to my colleague Matti here, uh, and we will try to help you out. Thanks for listening. I I guess the first question will be: Are there any more beer? <laughs> yes. So wait a sec. And yeah, tuusen tak, Karoliina. <laughs> it's an amazing lecture, and it was giving a lot of confidence that, like, at least some people are watching and trying to save us. 
<laughs> so the thing is that i'm actually um, watching a trend in linkedin uh, i don't know whether they are the human or the bots from china i'm so, sorry i didn't hear a question i i i i'm approaching by uh, chinese people most of the time like last 2 3 years and i i don't think they are human i mean but i don't know how do i know that like basically i think it could be a bots because the trend and the pattern is the same thing like uh, so the, what is the same thing sorry approaching somebody on linkedin on approaching my linkedin approaching from i'm sorry i'm getting old <laughs> i'm approaching in a similar pattern as the pattern is repetitive on my linkedin messaging so you are approached yeah i've been LinkedIn. approached yeah yeah because so, sometimes i say hi and then in the conversation the location is somewhere but there are most of the people they are in china or taiwan or yeah. singapore it's good that you mention uh, linkedin here as well uh, because now i'm really scared because you know i'm some i'm an investor with a large fund so there are some really famous i mean important people will be coming and they have some chinese also genuine guys are there yeah, but of I'm course. really like I have big headache with this kind of a bots. So I think that it could be Chinese bots or I don't so, know. So, so you you are thinking of how can we know if it's a legitimate or yeah. or a, is a human actor? or a bot? Because the pattern is like I mean, you know, I'm 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 in technology. I was a Nokia product yeah. manager, and then I was working in HP on the server side. So, basically, I've been getting the same pattern. So. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, it's really difficult to answer this, but I, what I, I wanted to say is that we, we can't be paranoid. We need to understand that uh, people will reach out to you. Uh, there will be headhunters, there will be think tanks, there will be startups, and you will be of interest. And don't say no to that just because I might have scared you. I hope not. Uh, but um, it's difficult to see the difference because if it's a threat actor, a state actor that really wants to approach people, it will be difficult to, to, to see if it's not real. There will be real company in the background or uh, they, they will fly you to London for the interview and have a nice meeting and there will be several meetings and no one will talk about espionage or, or information you should Yeah, you got share. the point. Because I've been going to the Mobile World Congress Barcelona, I visit the Shanghai uh, booth. I meet these guys, so th I know the genuine people. Okay. And I share the chat and other thing. And sometimes uh, it's a little tricky that like they say that like uh, the the location says Tampere, but in the conversation I can come to know that like they yeah. are from Singapore and other thing. That freaks me out. Maybe uh, we should talk after, so I can sure. hear you better than from Thank you. the back. But yeah. But LinkedIn is uh, definitely a, a place which is being used, especially during the pandemic. They couldn't approach people on, on conferences or, or uh, hotel, hotels at, um, uh, in Greece. So they um, moved over to LinkedIn more. Yeah, we have an, another one. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, not sure if you mentioned your book name, but I'd like to or the book's name. I'd like to read them sometimes. But uh, <clears throat> my main question is if there has to be known cases of Western, preferably European or more preferably the Nordic spies convicted for espionage in the countries mentioned. Yeah. Uh, practicing espionage uh, in China or Iran or Russia mm. because the conversation is always like Russians or uh, Chinese having espionage yeah. in Europe. But and the opposite, you think, yeah. yeah. And also, if European countries are actually spying on other European countries, or is it even feasible in the times we are living at the moment? Yeah. So uh, the reason that we talk a lot about, especially Russia, uh, nowadays, I don't think it comes as any surprise because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and in war times, there is an increased need of information and intelligence. So it has increased. And the reason we talk so much about Russia, China especially, is because it's the main threat actor towards Europe. And you, all the European intelligence and security services uh, agree on that. So all the cases I have, I only, you only talk about Russia. Well, I didn't have to look that hard 
to find these cases. But I will give you one example on, on the opposite, and that is the Norwegian guy called Frode. I don't know if you've read about him. He was arrested in Russia, uh, and he, um, uh, he was uh, more of a courier. Uh, do you say that? I would say that he was uh, bringing money in for someone else, and he was assigned by the, as mentioned in media, by the Norwegian uh, intelligence service. So he was working for them, but not as an employee, but as a Nor Norwegian citizen that did this when he was traveling there for business. And he was um, arrested, and now I think he's back home now because they switched him for, for a Russian spy. Uh, so it happens, uh, but it's not in the same uh, um, amount of cases. And, and all countries conduct espionage in different ways, both technical intelligence with cyber attacks, the signals intelligence where I started, and uh, also human intelligence with, uh, when recruiting spies. So all countries do that. And if European countries spy on each other, uh, probably. Uh, but th the, the consequences, it's, it's not good, it's not appreciated. The consequences and the risks are less than if, let's say, Russia gathers sensitive information on Finnish or Swedish energy supply in order to be able to shut us down to make us change opinion in certain uh, questions. Uh, one question. We talked about hiring process doing security clearance and so forth, which is good. But when it comes to preventive actions, for example, about the employees who are already inside the company, because everybody can be compromised. Yeah. What is your opinion or experience regarding those kind of actions? For example, a couple of months ago, we had a sort of tabletop exercise, mainly C-level and leadership individuals, and it was more or less like brainstorming, what is the situation where I could be compromised? Mm. Uh, the rules were that, first of all, the financial situation should be the same as it is now, so everybody's financial is stable. And also family was left out, meaning that you cannot threaten your kids or your wife or anybody else who is close to you. And in the end, it took multiple minutes for individuals to come with any kind of examples. For example, in my case, after a couple of minutes thinking, it was very easy to come with one example that you showed as well, thrill seeking. So I'm married, I'm financially good enough, everything is fine, good and so forth, <laughs> but everything is boring as fuck in yeah. the end. <laughs> Nothing is happening. Yeah. When you consider your youth, for example, I used to play a lot of contact sports, get mm. my thrill from some kind of activity. <laughs> now it's boring. Yeah. So if it's somebody could bring me a situation yeah. that I could get that adrenaline yeah. rush with limited risk of getting caught, mm. that would be alluring in the end. Yeah, but, but I think uh, everyone could be compromised. It depends, I would say, because uh, we are, if I ask you now, how, mu how many of you would like more money? Some people earn too much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and you, a lot of you probably have access to information that others would be interested in. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I guess that you haven't been happy at work every time. I mean, I haven't. But I, what I think is, uh, if I may use the word moral compass, I think that most of us, um, I mean, a lot of us want more uh, excitement in, in, in their lives, especially when in that situation we miss what we had, etc. Um, we would like to have more money. We're not happy at work all the time, but that doesn't mean that we would uh, be disloyal because we have this moral compass or whatever we want to call it. We understand that this is not a good idea. Uh, and most of the time people get caught. Sooner or later they do. And, and then it's not the end of just that career, it's the end of all career you could have, maybe family and friends and, and all this stuff. Uh, then we talk about threats, uh, and then we need to see, I mean, most people would do everything for their family. If you have kids and your, or your wife, husband, um, uh, it depends on how long you have been married, but still. <laughs> yeah, but um, 
So threats is one thing, but it's not that common that if we talk about state actors, that they threat other nationalities into cooperation. They want people who want to work with them. They don't want people who are scared from the beginning because they will be even more scared when they are uh, taking um, pictures of the screen because they don't want to print anything. They are afraid of the, the technical uh, traces of that. They don't want to download things or, or email things out of the company because they are afraid that they will get caught. So they don't want people who are scared from the beginning. They want people who, who want to do this because they are better than their manager understands. That's better for them. But of course it can happen. And that's why sometimes, for example, uh, certain um, positions, they need to say no to a perfect candidate uh, who doesn't have any bad inten intentions, but who has their family still in country X whatever country who uses this kind of methods. Because how can you, you, you can say no to money, you can say no for many reasons, but how can you say no if they say, well, uh, you will never see your family again, you will not be allowed in the country, or worse. And it doesn't have to be a threat. It can be, oh, I hear that your father needs a heart surgery, uh, and we have the best surgeon in the country. We'll do that for you. The only thing you have to do is, so that kind of thing is more difficult. But I think that people are just bored with, without these uh, personalities in the back, background. It's, it's not the most common reason. But I think it's good that you discuss it. OK, here's the last question. Finland has left, uh, let uh, one million Russians through the border in the last year. Uh, I personally have met some spies, I work with some spies, Chinese and Russians. Do you think uh, now, because of the war, we should have better practices, should we start to weed out people, or how would you um, advise us to uh, work in everyday life? Because, I mean, those are professional, we, we yeah. are just not thinking that way and you know there's million of them if there's only hundred thousand spies and gorillas uh, yeah. that's a that's a big threat I think it's important to understand that when we're talking about we're not talking about the Russians we're talking about the Russian intelligence services and the methods they use and even to put pressure on their own uh, citizens so that we don't say that all Russians have bad intentions or all from this and that country have bad intentions but what we need to look at is for this position, for this specific position, what will this person, whoever it is, one of us, uh, what will uh, this person have access to? And um, could it, there be any vulnerabilities? This could be one vulnerability. Uh, a gambling issue or, or attitudes towards security could be other vulnerabilities. Uh, are there vulnerabilities that are um, too risky for us to accept? So it's from case to case. I think um, uh, that is important to stress because otherwise we are excluding a lot of people uh, without knowing. Uh, and also um, intelligence organizations are very clever. When mo one method doesn't work, they will choose another one. So if we are not hiring um, people from country X, uh, they will send someone from another country, recruit someone from another country with a, um, who sympathizes with their uh, lifestyle or whatever it is, ideology, uh, or even use illegals that are not obviously from a certain country. So it, it, there's no 100% guarantee with security vetting and with all of this I'm talking about, I realize that. But uh, it's like not locking your door because the burglar can uh, enter anyway so we will still try and we we need to do what we can to make it as difficult and um yeah as, as difficult as possible for them to access what we don't want them to get access to and this is of course with criminal threat actors as well okay okay thank you So yeah, thank you, Carolina, and thanks all the all the speakers.
uh, we have now something like uh, 15 minutes left because yeah we need to